Okay, now, now, now it's working. Okay. <laughs> Hello, my fellow net hackers. Uh, I'm Edson Yanaga. I'm a Java champion and also a Microsoft MVP. I'm here today to interview a great friend, Clemence Coffier. Uh, did I say it right? Yes. Okay, because he's French. I don't know how to pronounce these French names correctly. And uh, Clemence is a uh, software engineer at Red Hat, and he works in a very cool project called Vertex. You know, everybody these days are talking about reactive programming. How can we d create distributed systems in an effective way? How can we create these this systems in a reliable way, a reactive way? So uh, uh, I guess one of the questions that everybody's asking, and maybe we could answer, try to answer that, what in fact is reactive programming? Well, the first thing to define in what reactive the word reactive means, and actually reactive, if you look at uh, in the several doors, it will just say, well, it's something that is reacting to stimulus. So that, that's all. And a reactive software is going to be a software that will react to stimulus. So then we have two things to see that. We can do that on the programming level. So that will be reactive programming that looks like a bit, it's a subset of functional programming where you will um, um, handle streams and you will observe streams and every time that you have an event, so a stimuli inside these streams, then you will react to that and produce other streams. So that's one way of doing that. So we have Eric, we have Spring Reactor to do that. And there is another way to look to the reactive world is to think, well, let's not do that at the programming level, but really at the architecture level and then having components that will react to other components by message, but also to their state and to the state of the system, like the load, the failures, the networks, and so on. And here, that's actually what we call reactive system is this, and it's going to be dynamic, it's going to be like a living entity. Something fail, it will react. A request arrive, it will react. Where it starts to be a bit more confusing, so we have reactive programming and reactive systems, but you can implement reactive systems using reactive programming. Wow, mm -hmm. that starts to be a bit weird. But a reactive system will react to message, but if you consider the sequence of message, you have a stream. So as you have a stream of message, you can use reactive programming to implement that one. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's one of the cool things that Vertex does. Vertex will let you build your reactive systems, but you can use reactive programming to build it. To okay. have an easy API, to avoid the callback health and stuff like that. Okay, and I don't know if uh, the guys uh, watching us, uh, 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 since you s mentioned Vertex, uh, uh, can what is Vertex? Is it a framework, a library, a platform? Uh, w what is that? Vertex is a toolkit. Aha! Okay. So it's not. But a framework. what's the difference? It's yeah. not a framework. It's w you uh -huh. can build your framework with that. Actually, Vertex is just a jar file. So you take this jar file, put that in your class pass, do create an instance of Vertex, and that's all. So it's not an app server, it's not a container, it's not a framework, but you can build all of this with Vertex. So as it's just a jar file, it's very simple to start. You don't need any plugins. You just will create your own main, uh, so public static void main to start your Vertex app. So it's very simple. Actually, it's, it's a simpler development model. Well, it's a development model you learn at school. Okay, you is it a big jar? Or it's a very, very small jar. I don't have the size, but it's really small. And actually, when you create a fat jar, so when you take your application, uh, Vertex and Vertex dependencies, it's not that fat. Something that will not exceed a couple of megabytes. So we are really far from the 60 megabytes that we see in other okay. frameworks. But actually, we are not a framework. Okay, it sounds a bit uncommon because when you're thinking about distributed systems, if you have a message bus, uh, clustering capabilities, you know, as application servers these days to have these capabilities, they have hundreds of, or maybe gigabytes of, of, of file size. So how uh, it's pretty amazing that you can do all of this. Uh, in fact, is it really possible? Does it work? Uh, yes, it does. It does. Yeah. It does work. Uh, it was a work pretty well. It's actually pretty fast. It's it's built on top of Netty, and it provides some really nice API on top of Netty, so you don't have to deal with Netty yourself. We provide a higher level API, and it just ne out of Netty you can build everything you said. So the clustering actually well, We have TCP connections between all nodes. The event bus is just this. Then we have a cluster manager to create group communication. So we have different implementation. You can use Azelcast, you can use Apache Ignite, you can use a Zoho Keeper. So it's up to you. Well, depend on your use case, the one you will pick. But that's all. And when you package all of this, then you have a mm -hmm. fat jar that is not that big because, well, it's all based on this low level. Well, 
basic building blocks. Actually, that's something interesting. Vertex is not an all-in-one solution. It will just provide you the building blocks, and it's up to you to build what you want out of that. So in terms of building blocks, we will have HTTP client, server, TCP client, server, asynchronous uh, DNS lookup, event bus, clustering, round robin, failover, and so on and so on and so on. So everything you need to create a really, really cool app that will be fast, resilient, and scalable. Okay, uh, because uh, I've seen a bit of reactive code, uh, uh, especially in Vertex, and it seems to me that uh, when we were back to the 80s or 90s, when we used the, like callback-based programming, you just have events and you pass a callback to be called when something happens. And I don't know if it's natural these days, because most of the Java developers, they are used like to imperative programming, and we have a lot of these blocking APIs. I don't know, does Vertex has a, a, a role in this world? C can I still be using these old libraries that I use every day with, with Vertex? So one first thing is uh, you're not old enough, but it was not in the 80s, but more or less in the 60s that we are okay. already <laughs> using callbacks, so <laughs> imagine that. So, yes, this callback style, actually just how we implement Vertex, but we provide some other style to develop that. We provide futures, Vertex futures, where you can compose them and stuff like that, and we provide Eric support, where you can really use well, all the Eric Java and stream and so on. So, you don't have to use the callback here, but what is very cool is Vertex to be fast is using a non-blocking development model, but most of the libraries today that we found are blocking. So like GDBC, like well, file access, simple stream, and so on. Vertex will let you um, use those libraries because we provide the construct to do that. So you can use any libraries with Vertex. It doesn't need to be Vertex aware. You can use absolutely everything. And that's, uh, that really helps the adoption of Vertex. Okay. And I don't know, do, do you think that the uh, reactive programming style, uh, it fits any domain model? Or maybe there are some specific use cases where it's a re re uh, really good fit? Well, it has some use cases where it's much better than uh, the imperative model. Okay. Um, there is obviously use case where re the reactive model doesn't really make sense or it's not natural. It's more natural, like well, batching and stuff like that. You don't necessarily want this. Um, but for Every application where uh, you you will receive requests, uh, so messages, you have to handle that. Then the reactive programming model is definitely what you want, because it's it makes such kind of application really really easy to to develop. Um, speaking about history, this is very similar to what actors and agents were doing during the 60s. So actually, reactive is not new. It's really? very old. It's oh, actually very, very old. I thought it was a new concept that just arrived. Well, you know, we just rebrand stuff and recycling <laughs> okay. ideas and stuff like that. But actually, all the concepts that we have behind Reactive, something really old and older than us. Uh, okay. Uh, well, uh, maybe mainly because that uh, distributed systems theories has been like uh, around for many years, but just about these days, people are talking about distributed systems. Uh, it used to be just a monolith before. Well, actually, we, we may start right at the beginning we decided to do distributed system. Because, well, seriously, a non-distributed system is much easier to do and to build. It's easier to debug and so on. So, But why in the 60s they say, well, let's do distributed system. Let's do the painful way where the easy way will work. But at that time, the uh, power and the, yeah, the CPUs and the memory we have was too limited. So instead of trying to build, build, build really great computers mm -hmm. and powerful computers, it was impossible. It was too expensive. Mm -hmm. So we say, well, let's try to build smaller one and make a network out of that. Okay. Um, two days, so 50 years later, more or less, um, <laughs> we're almost less, more or less in the same paradigm. So before we were using mainframe and big computer, and now we start using small one because mainframe are just too expensive. And the advantage of this is that it gives you a synchronous evolution of all your nodes. So you don't have to synchronize everything and to deploy everything and so on. You can have this will be released next week, this will be released in two weeks, this is already running and makes this evol evolution working and so on. So it gives you a flexibility. Give you a great flexibility. But well Flexibility comes with a huge risk, yeah. and it's distributed system, so we know that it's going to fail at some point. It will, it will fail. Okay. We just don't know when. While well, we know that it's going to fail in production, but we don't know well when. So you need to be prepared to handle those failures. Okay. And again, Vertex is really good for this.
Mm -hmm. Does it have, because people are talking about uh, Hystrix for fallbacks, handler, these days in the speed systems, uh, Vertex does that too? So Vertex provides a uh, different way to handle resilience and to implement resilience. The first one is the world development model as a concept of failure, as so first class citizen. So you can't, you will have to handle your failures. Uh, the second thing is that we are, can do, uh, we can deal with timeouts too. But again, timeouts doesn't mean that the operation has failed. It just means that something bad happened that the operation could have been uh, could have been a success. And we also have circuit breakers. So you could use these tricks. You could use any circuit breakers. We also provide one uh, that fit in the vertex execution model. So a single threaded event loop and stuff like that. It's a very powerful uh, circuit breaker that provide just enough features that you need. Um, if you really need more, you can use these tricks. We provide everything to use these tricks too. So it's up to you to, to use the one you want. Okay, cool. It seems that uh, maybe we should start learning more about Reactive. Uh, and I guess that Verdix can be a very good choice for this. Okay. So, uh, Tamal, thank you very much for thank all of you. this lesson because I learned a lot of things. I hope that you all have learned it too. And I hope to catch you later on more conferences. Of course. Yeah. Of course. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.